Welcome to the Reality Check Podcast. I'm Zachary Phillips. So today I've got a fiction piece for you called I'm More Than Just a Dying Car. He knew his time was running out, yet he was okay with it. Even before he was diagnosed, he knew where he was headed. His fate was the same as everyone's. Death. One day soon he would stop breathing, his heart would stop beating, and his neurons would stop firing. At that exact moment, he would be dead. However, that exact moment also contained a paradox that he couldn't quite resolve. Despite his body containing exactly the same stuff as it did a moment earlier, a moment later that same body containing that same stuff would no longer be alive. The question remained, what was fundamentally different between that one moment and the next? What exactly happened that would turn his body from alive to dead? Lying on the hospital bed, he mused this question over again. His pain was steadily increasing, but then again, so were his, his, dosi his dosages of morphine. It wouldn't be long now. He toyed with analogies, yet they seemed woefully inadequate. Take a car, for example. It only functions when, one, most of its parts are present, two, it is fueled, and three, it has a driver to operate. Take one of those components away and the car won't start. But is it dead? The parts can break down, of course, but broken parts can be replaced. Was the same true for the body? He thought so. His artificial hip and transplanted kidney agreed. If a broken car park isn't replaced and that car never used again, you could argue that that car had died. However, if each component part is replaced over time, that car continues to live. Theoretically, you could replace every single part of the car, piece by piece, over time, placing all of the older parts aside. Eventually, the car would consist of entirely new pieces, with all of the old pieces sitting unused beside it. In that case, which car is the real car? Which car lives? The one with the new replaced pieces, or the broken husk? At what point did the original car die, and a new one come into being? Regardless, the car was alive and would remain so if its part got replaced when they were broken. If he similarly replaced all the components of his body, would he live? Or would some new person be created? His head started to hurt. He called the nurse for a sip of water and took it by straw. Gone were the days of self-sustained drinking, as well as, it seemed, his ability to contemplate on such matters deeply. Still, he persisted. There was nothing else to do but wait. A car without fuel cannot operate. The component parts may all be present, but without a spark to ignite movement, those parts remain idle. He asked for some water. Food, water, and oxygen. The body's fuel. Fast only one of these three essentials and you'll certainly die. He knew this much. His basic understanding of biology taught him that these essentials were broken down in the body and converted into energy. He hadn't stopped eating or drinking, and he certainly wouldn't voluntarily stop breathing. Yet. All the same, he would soon die, despite being regularly fueled. He chuckled at the idea of a car's superior ability to persist in a state of relative stasis. Why would a car sit empty for months, only to instantly come back to life the moment it was refueled? Try feeding a hamburger to a corpse and see what happens. He chuckled again, this time coughing up some blood. The nurses came once more, kindly cleaning him up, and politely rebuking him not to overexert himself too much. If only he could speak, he would demand that as a condition of the execution of his will, that a hamburger was to be fed to him exactly three months after his passing. It was worth a shot, right? What was the difference between a car and a man? What enabled the car to come roaring back to life, but not the man? He knew it had something to do with the driver. The driver turned the key. The driver got the whole process started, and through his will, got the car moving. Together with the driver, the car is truly alive. An empty, an empty idling car was more akin to his new roommate, brain dead. The body was functioning, but the mind was empty. But who was the driver of his body, and who was thinking these thoughts right now? How much control did he even have over the whole affair? Did he have any? He knew that he chose to start this whole car analogy, but didn't choose where he would go during his contemplation of the analogy. This proved to him that he at least had partial control. He could steer the car of his mind to some degree, but not completely. In fact, 
The more he tried, the more his mind resisted. If left unguided, his mind wandered. It began to drive itself down uncharted, unknown roads. He couldn't predict the next thought that would arise, nor how would he feel about having those thoughts. True, he could force a thought, but really, who would choose which thought he would decide to force himself to think? And even if he managed to force a particular thought, he certainly couldn't maintain that line of thought to the exclusion of all others. Prior to his illness, his body seemed to be more under his control. It moved where and when he desired. He could not stop his body from hearing, breathing, or excreting waste. He could not choose. He could choose to hold his breath for a short while, but eventually his body would override that choice and breathe. So who was in control? Or more poignantly, was someone in control at all? Perhaps he was more akin to one of those newfangled electric cars that drive themselves places. Pre-programmed to respond and act in particular ways when certain environmental stimuluses presented themselves. He heard an alarm go off behind him, one of the many machines attached to his body, taking measurements and adjusting levels. He didn't have the strength to check which one it was, nor to call for assistance. He didn't even have the strength to open his eyes. He didn't trust them, not one bit. If one of these cars had the desire to choose between crashing into a wall and killing the driver, or crashing into a family and saving the driver, what would the car choose? Who made that decision? Still, he knew that throughout his life, he had acted on impulse. In emergencies and in moments of heated tension, he had acted in ways he never thought he was capable of. Overwhelmed by emotion, he cried and laughed, swore and struck, loved and lied. In those moments, he made the choices. The car's driver can choose where the car will go, but is required to stay within certain confines, a road, driveways, or other designated areas. Further still, its speeds are limited and behaviours are modified by signs and other guidance. A driver could choose to disregard these warnings, of course, but quickly he would find his car impounded or destroyed via accident. Was he not the same in this sense? Did he not follow the social conventions of his day? eating the way others ate, following the same trends, doing the same kinds of work. At his core, did he not believe basically what everyone else believed? Still, he knew he was born in, was he born in another time or place, it would have been a similar product of his time. His morals, values, religion and political preferences would have adjusted accordingly. He had different, had he had different parents or different school chums, he would have turned out differently, but he still wouldn't have been able to choose how. With a sudden burst of clarity, he realised that he had no control. None. He was not the driver of his car. He was just a passenger. Merely someone along for the ride. This dying body was no more his than the rental car he had hired on his last holiday. He would take in no more fuel. He would replace no more parts. The driver was leaving. Only the passenger would remain, waiting for another ride to begin. So that piece was called I'm More Than Just a Dying Car. And if you want to read that piece, I'll put the link down below in the show notes to the blog post of it. I like to write fiction as a sort of act of self-care and sharing it's always a bit confronting because it sort of feels, well, it is obviously an art form. And unlike, you know, a blog or a process or a podcast, it's definite. The words you choose are just there and you just say, here you go, world. And that can be quite confronting. That being said, one of my goals is to write a full fiction novel and, you know, I'm in the process of it, for those who've been following me, I'm on the on the process of getting my first full fiction novel done called Lucidity. And it's scary. It's a massive project and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm biting off more than I can chew, but I'm excited to talk about it and share it because, oof, it's, it's, it's something that I want to get done. And I don't know, there's something about good fiction authors that, really appeal to me. They they seem to have created this whole internally consistent world full of people, full of plot and a whole bunch of stuff and just press go and just watch. This story that I just wrote, that I just read out, felt like it just sort of came to me and a lot of the stuff that I do, it seems to just come and I just sort of have to express it. Sounds very wanky, sounds very artistic, but, but hey, it's the reality of the situation, right? So anyway, if you want to check out my fiction, I do have a anthology fiction novella called Upgrade Out. I'll put the links down below to that. You can check it out. But I just wanted to make you aware of a couple more things before I let you go. I've released my second Skillshare video course. The first one I think is up to about 30 reviews, all 
exceedingly positive. The second one's just been released. It is on managing panic attacks. So if you have a panic attack and you've had them before, you know how much they freak you out, you know how much they can be overwhelming and just debilitating. This course covers four different strategies that I use personally that I've learned from my psychologists and a bunch of books reading and what I've shared with and talked to and determined from other people and what's works on myself. And I'm putting it into one course, sharing it with you. If you sign up using the link below, you'll get free access to the course for two months. Um, in my course, my other course, as well as all of the courses on Skillshare. Two months for free, and then within that time, you can watch my courses and then cancel, and there's no cancellation fee, you can just, you know, it's just a trial. So it's a perfect excuse to give it a shot, check it out, and you might like it. Either way, the following that link is a way to support the podcast as everyone that signs up, I get a little bit of a kickback from Skillshare saying, hey, look, I got someone to join up. But like I said, feel free to unsubscribe once you've watched my courses. So there's that. Second, um, last thing I want to mention is I've started a separate YouTube channel called Archer's Adventures. For those who don't know, Archer's my son and he's, you know, in my <laughs> biased opinion, he's one of the most cutest little monkeys ever. Um, I've started to share some of the videos of his cuteness, Archer's Adventures, because you know, he likes adventures. So I'll put a link down below to the YouTube channel. If you like it, check it out, click it. It's literally just 10 seconds to one minute videos of him being a little cutie. So yeah, check it out. Like I said, if you if you can, check out the Skillshare course. Um, like I said, it's free. No reason not to. If you like the podcast, you like what I'm doing here, please like, share, subscribe. And the best thing you can do is tell someone about it. You can do that by writing a review, leaving positive comments, or just telling someone, say, hey, check this podcast out. It's great. Catch up.